Graham Frost has a unique life story. Today, he's going to share some of it with us. With a talk entitled, It's Never Too Late to Change Direction, please welcome Graham Frost. Three months after my 17th birthday, I found myself walking down the road from my parents' house like this, with most of my belongings in six plastic carrier bags. Looking behind me, I could see my father and my mother following me. They were both in tears, and I'd never seen my dad cry before. I wasn't to see my mother again for 27 years. That decision to leave home was the biggest and the most important decision I ever made in my life. And you're probably thinking to yourself, what on earth made him want to go and leave home at the age of 17 and never go back? Well, I'll take you back to the beginning. I was born in 1956. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> into a family that was involved in the fundamentalist cult. And to begin with, it was okay. I had two parents. We lived in a two-up, two-down house in a town in Essex. And gradually, I had two sisters and another brother, and I ended up being the oldest of six. I had five cousins who I was quite close to, they were all boys. I used to go quite often around to their house. And then I started school. And on my second day at school, my mother has since told me that I said to her, I want to go to school on my own. I don't need you to take me anymore. And for the rest of my time at primary school, I walked a mile to school on my own every day. Gradually, my sisters joined me. So I suppose I was always a bit independent. But I blame my parents for bringing me up that way. So life was okay. Gradually, I got a bit older. Went to secondary school. Now, I wasn't supposed to have any friends outside of my church. And up until I went to secondary school, I pretty much stuck to that. Because, you know, I was a good boy. I was reasonably happy. And then, about six months after I started secondary school, I had to travel a distance to secondary school. And somebody said to me, would you like to come round to my house after school? And I said, I'm not really supposed to. And he said, well, nobody will know apart from me and my mum, and you. So I went round to his house and had a drink, and I can't remember what we did. We probably played a board game or something, because this is a long before the days of computers or anything <laughs> like that. And I rode my bike home. Didn't tell anybody. Nothing happened. <laughs> I didn't get run over by a bus or anything. There was no sort of judgment or anything like that on me. So I thought, oh, I'll do it again. Unfortunately, one day, my new friend, my new secret friend and I, decided that we were going to go to Woolworths. Does anybody here remember Woolworths? <laughs> Not that long ago, disappeared <laughs> from our high street. And Anybody else here prepared to put their hands up and say they ever stole anything out of the wall? <laughs> <laughs> Good some hands on right up. Yes, we did. We took some pick and mix and something else, yes, and we put it in our pocket. And unfortunately for me, I was the store detective's example of the day that day. And I felt a hand on my shoulder as I was walking out of the store. And the store detective took me to the manager's office, and believe it or not, they called the police on me and my friend. Now, my parents didn't have a phone in the house, so the police had to go round to their house to get my dad. 
Can you imagine the net curtains twitching to the police pulling up outside the Frost's house and taking my dad away to bring me back to, back to, back home. And they did take me to court and at the age of 11, I was put on probation for shoplifting from walls. But looking back, I'm not sorry that that happened because it was part of my journey to where I am today. What happened as a result of that was that the people in the church, my cousins, were told that I was a bad influence. And they were sort of shrink away a bit back from there. So I became, a, I became a little bit lonely. Didn't have so many friends in the church as I once had. And then about a year after all that happened, my father got a job in London, in a factory in the East End of London. And six months after he started work there, he decided he was going to move the family to London. I went to a school where nobody knew me. Nobody knew anything about my background. I don't know if anybody else here remembers the 1960s and 70s, looking around me, quite a young crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but when you went to school, most young men in the 1960s and 70s didn't get their hair cut very often. They had hairstyles, <laughs> <laughs> or even longer. And I was, I was, I was unusual because I had to have a. One of the rules of the church was that we had, we had to have, had to have short hair. In fact, at one point in my life, my mother used to put a basin on my head and cut around. It. I don't know if anybody else ever experienced that, but it's, it scars you for life. Really. As you can see, you have to use your imagination to do the hair at all. But I did. Once upon a time, I did have very long hair, even longer than Anthony's, and a droopy moustache. You, know, you can imagine that. Back in the day, I don't have any photos, or if I did, I wouldn't share them with you. <laughs> so, I'm in London, gradually went to school, just decided uh, to have the odd cigarette now and again. Did anybody else carry a packet of cigarettes in their pocket? when they were at school and think their parents didn't know they smoked in the bathroom with the window open, yeah, did that, got caught smoking. My dad thought I was on the, on the road to ruin. And at the age of 16, I left school because education wasn't particularly valued in the church that I was brought up in. I wanted to stay on and do A-levels, but as the eldest of six, my dad said, you need to, you need to, get up to work and start contributing to the family budget. So I got a job as an office junior in an area of London called Shoreditch. Anybody's familiar with London? It's quite a trendy area now, it wasn't then. <laughs> and went to work in this office with normal people. And you know, after a few, I mean, after a few months, I wasn't supposed to eat my lunch with them, but after a few months, I started doing that anyway. And after about six months, I thought, these people are okay. When they invited me to the pub on Friday lunchtime, I thought, no, you know. So I went. Had a couple of beers Friday lunchtime. I don't know if anybody else remembers the days when he used to go to the pub on a Friday lunchtime from work and go back to the office and not a whole lot more work to get done <laughs> that day. It's not like that. Work is far too serious now, in my opinion. But in those days, that used to go on. I was one of those people. This was completely like living a double life. And I realised, at the age of 17 and a bit, that I really couldn't continue with this double life, and the life away from my family was the one that I really wanted. So I started looking for an opportunity to leave. And the opportunity came along when somebody I knew took over a pub in West London. And I went over there and asked them if they had any jobs. Now, in those days, a lot of pubs used to employ staff that lived in on the premises, so I got, I got myself a new job and somewhere to live. And there I went, off I went to West London to 
this new job. And I jumped from the frying pan into the fire a little bit. Because this pub turned out to be one of the roughest pubs in London. <laughs> <coughs> or one of the roughest council estates in West London at the time. And people would regularly fight and there were bloodstains on the wooden floor. And you wouldn't believe. I could tell you, I could spend the whole evening telling you stories just, just from there. But I did, unfortunately, fall into bad company while I was there. And the bad company led me to, into petty crime. Now, I never, I never hurt anybody, but I stole things, and I'm not proud of it. I stole things from people. And that led to me being arrested, not once, not twice, three times. I didn't learn my lesson. Made some wrong decisions. So having made this big positive decision to leave my family, I then, for the next year or so, made some pretty stupid decisions and ended up in a place called Borstal. I was a Borstal boy, yes, yeah, so I, left, I left home when I was 17, but at the age of just before my 19th birthday, I was a Borstal boy in a striped shirt in a Borstal in Huntingdonshire, coincidentally not very far from where I live now. And you know what? I don't regret that either. Because somebody sat me down while I was there, had a conversation with me, and he was my personal officer, and his name was Mr. Taylor, and I've never forgotten what Mr. Taylor said to me. He said, Frosty, he said, you're not a criminal. He said, we get boys that come in here, he said, we know from the time they walk in the door that there's nothing we can do with them. But he said, you're not like that. He said, when you get out of here, he said, I want you to go and look in the mirror and decide who you are. And he said, you're not a criminal. That was when I realised that I needed to take a different path from the one I was taking. So eventually, I left Borstal. Very fortunately, some people that I knew, who also ran a pub in London, had offered me a job when I came out. I don't know what I would have done if that hadn't happened, because I would have been going out to nothing. I would have been too stubborn to go back to my family, I know that. So I don't know what would have happened. So that, you know, you always need someone. None of us can really do it on our own, completely. Those people, John and Pauline, and very fortunately, I'm, he's, he's passed away. I was able to go to Ireland, where they've now retired to, and um, thank them for what they did for me about five years ago. But so uh, they took me in and gave me a job. So I thought, everything's going to be hunky-dory now. You know, it's going to be fine. Moved over to the other side of the river to a place called Putney, and we're working for them there. Eventually, I thought, you know, I don't really want to be doing this for my whole life, so I went and got a job in a bakery. Didn't like that because I had a night shift. So I went back into the hospitality business again. Eventually, I met a young lady who said to me, after we'd been together for about a year or two, don't you think it's time you got a proper job? It's what young ladies sometimes do, isn't it? <laughs> but she was right. So, I applied for a job on the railway. I don't know if anybody else remembers when they used to have proper restaurant cars on trains. People used to wear those awful uniforms with the red stripe down the side and the red jacket. It's a long time ago, it was the 1979 when I started that job. And I found something that I enjoyed doing. I was with somebody that I, I loved being with. And yet there was something, about six months into that, something happened that I started feeling not very well, tired, I was losing weight, didn't have much energy. Eventually my partner persuaded me to go to the doctors. Men don't like going to the doctors, do they? Maybe some women don't, but I know still, I'm, still I'm, I resist going to the doctors. To cut a long story short, 
I went to the doctors twice. The doctors misdiagnosed me, and eventually my partner took me to the local hospital, St George's Hospital in Tooting. If anybody knows it, massive hospital on the, on the outskirts, I think, in southwest London where we lived. And I was taken in to see the doctor. I don't know if anybody else has ever had serious illness in the room. I hope, I hope not. When you have about five different doctors coming to look at you, and they all look a bit. They're all looking very serious, you know there's something wrong. And eventually, they said, have you got anybody with you, Mr. Foss? I said, yes, my girlfriend's out in the reception area. They went and got her, brought her in. And they told me that I had testicular cancer. And it was quite far advanced, and I needed to come back into hospital the next day to have an operation, which I had. I thought that was the end of it, didn't I? No, I had... Six courses of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I was off work for 15 months. You know what kept me going? The thought of what was at the other side of that experience. I had to think positive. I had to think about what was going to be at the end. I was in a happy relationship with somebody and that was what kept me focused on getting through it. It was the worst experience I've ever been through. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I'm here to tell the tale. You know, I went down at one point, I, w I was five stone lighter than I am now during that treatment. I was seven stone, I couldn't wear my own clothes, but I kept focused on the goal that was in front of me, which was going back to the life that I had made for myself, which fortunately I did. So the message I have for you this evening, <clears throat> whatever the decision is, you might be perfectly happy in your life, but you might have a decision that you need to make. It could be around your life, it could be around your business. <clears throat> as I quite often say, the decision you have to make could be as easy as going home and telling the person you share your life with that you love them. Or it could be as difficult as going home and telling them that you don't. <laughs> they're, the two they're the two different areas. I <coughs> made that decision to leave my family behind. I don't regret it. Thankfully, in 2001, out of the blue, my dad rang me. I'd always kept in touch, I'd always written to them. <coughs> And I went to see my parents and I've had regular contact from then until today. And, I'm, and I was able to see my mother five days before she passed away 18 months ago. I saw my dad as recently as last week. And he's, he's, got, <coughs> he's got dementia now. And he said to me last week, so he always asked me, what do you do for a living again? <laughs> and when I say to him, I deliver training and do public speaking for a living, he says, and people pay you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and he still, still keeps my feet on the ground. Anyway, I've enjoyed sharing my story with you. Remember, it's about decision making, it's about being who you are, and it's about always staying positive in the face of adversity. Thank you.